So I find myself here. And I'm looking at everybody. And wondering, what's going on? I was told that if I come informally dressed to Israel, I'd be very comfortable. So my son-in-law, Tal, took me to various meetings yesterday. And I was informally dressed. And everybody we met with wore a jacket and a tie. I looked at Tal and I said, I thought you said they were informally dressed. So I complied. I was informally dressed. He said, well, to honor you, they wore jackets and ties. <laughs> so I said, OK, tomorrow, when we go to speak to the group, I'm going to wear a jacket and tie on the assumption that they will also. It didn't work out that way. <laughs> so let me tell you, whether it's with a jacket and tie or without a jacket and tie, not terribly important. What's really important is that Clara and I, that's my bride, we just got together recently, 58 years. I got to tell you, she's the best wife I ever had. But nevertheless, the reason I feel as good as I do is because we're back in Israel. And we love coming here. I really didn't have a clue as to what Israel was all about when we, we were newlyweds. She must have known something which doesn't surprise me. She always knows something. As a matter of fact, I have a t-shirt that says, I don't need Google. I have my wife. <laughs> However, as the kids were growing up, she said to me one day, she said, it's time to go to Israel. I said, sweetheart, I'm busy. I've got all kinds of things to do. Why do we have to go to Israel? Well, it's because it's important for us to know about our heritage. I said, but honey, I've got a lot of things to do. She said, you don't understand. You're going to Israel. <laughs> Guess what? We went to Israel. I don't quite know what happened. But we came and we looked. And we slept here, we slept there, we slept everywhere. But something happened to me on that trip. I never quite figured it out. But I can tell you, our lives were transformed then we showed the children as much as we could possibly show them. It gave our lives a dimension that was truly spectacular. And we just began to comprehend the extraordinary country that Israel is. And we just began to understand the importance of the state of Israel 
to the well-being of Jews, no matter where they may be around the globe. Result, she became deeply involved in the United Jewish Appeal. I became deeply involved in the United Jewish Appeal and then in Federation of Jewish Philanthropies. She chaired the campaigns. She raised hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. I chaired the campaigns. I became chairman of the board of the United Jewish Appeal and Federation of Jewish Philanthropies in New York. It was the most wonderful experience of our lives, being deeply involved in Jewish communal work. And the wonderful thing about it is that as we got involved, it gave a signal to our children. And guess what? We didn't have to say anything. They just followed in our footsteps and started doing the same thing that we had done. And it's not a doubt in my mind, our eight grandchildren are probably going to follow suit, just as we've had did, and just as their parents did. So, coming here to speak to you tonight, I said, I'd love it, because it gives us a chance to see our in-laws, our machatonim. They're right here in Tel Aviv. So. It's a pleasure. And any time we can come to see them, and any time we can bring the children and the grandchildren, we do it. And the truth of the matter is, Clara and I led hundreds of missions to Israel. We were here so many times. Every chance we could get to come back, we took it because it gave us such intense pleasure. And we knew we were doing a lot of good, good for the country. I had the pleasure of working pretty much with every prime minister of Israel from Yitzhak Shamir forward. When the Russian Olim were coming in at the rate of 50, 60, 70,000, Yitzhak Shamir said to me one day, he said, Larry, you have to help us. You have to help us build housing because they're coming in and we have no housing for them. He, we, need, we need large quantities of high quality, low cost concrete housing but it had to be a kind of housing that was, would not destruct. It was indestructible, it had to last because there were so many air raids and so many explosions and things going on in the country. So we had to learn how to provide that housing. Truth of the matter is we found ourselves beginning of 91. I listened to the Prime Minister. He said, I need you in Israel, I need you in Jerusalem. Came over. Just at that time, the Scuds also came over. Got to the hotel in Tel Aviv. They told me, here's your gas mask. Here's the stuff you have to put on your arms in case the tear gas or that the, the, the gas rather gets to, gets to your skin. And when you hear an alarm upstairs, you have two minutes to collect your personal belongings and go down to the safe floor. So I said, okay. Now we had appointments the next morning with Shamir and a whole mess of other people. Got upstairs. And 
I looked at the clock. It was about midnight. So I took all my personal belongings, put them together with my gas mask and so forth, got into bed, went to sleep. Uneventful, except that about 2 o'clock in the morning, I heard, uh, 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 uh. I said, okay, an alarm. Got all my personal belongings together, my gas mask, go outside the room, go to the stairs, go down to the safe floor, and sure enough, they're on the safe floor. Lots of chairs, lots of water, lots of blankets, windows are all covered and so forth. But nobody, no people. <laughs> I looked and looked and looked and I said, something's wrong. I pick up the phone, spoke to the woman in the, the lobby. I said, is there an air raid alarm? She said, sir, that's a car alarm. <laughs> I said, you know what? I'm not very bright. I'm not meant for this part of the world. <laughs> so, went back upstairs, went to my room, put all the stuff down. I said, this time, I'm going to sleep. I went to sleep. And guess what? Three o'clock in the morning, I hear, uh, I knew right away. It was an air raid alarm. I learned. Took all my stuff, personal belongings, gas mask. <laughs> Go to the stairway. <laughs> and there... Finally, I see people going down to the safe floor. But then I see other people, young people, going up the stairs. I said, where are you going? They said, we're press. I said, so where are you going? They said, we're going to the roof. I said, what the hell am I going to the safe floor for? I turned around, went with them up to the roof. And what a show I saw. It was powerful. I never saw anything like this in my life because what they had the Scud missile, the Patriot missile launchers were in the park right next to the Tel Aviv Hilton. And they kept sending the Patriot missiles up into the cloud cover because there's a lot of clouds that night. You could hear the explosions as the Patriot missiles intercepted the Scud missiles. And then you could see flaming pieces of Patriot missiles coming down to, the, to Earth. It hit some houses, caused a few fires, but that was the total damage done. It's a, it was a miracle. But it was a show that I had never seen before in my life. And I said to myself, eh, those Scud missiles, they won't bother me. They'll leave me alone. Of course, I didn't tell Clara. For months later, once I told her, oi, did she give me a geshrai? <laughs> Nevertheless, Coming to Israel was always exciting and it always presented a beauty and a joy and a fulfillment that we loved every minute of it. Thank you. Okay, I'm supposed to talk about the World Trade Center. So how we got sidelined, I'm not quite sure, but okay. So we'll try to do better. So now you're looking at the picture of what the Trade Center is going to look like. We were it was supposed to look like this after 10 years. By 2013, 2010, 2011, by 2011, it was supposed to be done. But something happened. It didn't go that well. And with government, it was a public-private partnership. I was the private side. Government was the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. They owned the land. So it took a little longer. So what happened on the way? Well, I'll show you. What happened was that I ended up rebuilding the Trade Center, got into all kinds of problems, and I never dreamt when I was growing up I never had a clue that I'd be involved in such problems, in such controversy. I look at these pictures and I say, eh, I was an old kid. I built model airplanes. I flew them, had an older sister. She drove me crazy, but what are you gonna do? Had normal parents, you know, very conventional family. Two, what? oh, just a minute, gotcha. Oh, well, okay, there is, as a normal kid, with a sister, normal parents, 
Everything's similar. And here, I joined my father in his real estate business as a broker, and I starved to death. And by this time, I was married to Clara. Thank God she was a school teacher, so she was teaching, and she earned $3,200 a year. Guess what? On $3,200 a year, I didn't have to make any money. It was enough money to live on. We had a Chevrolet. We had an apartment. Paid $110 a month for rent. It was terrific. Everything was very good. Of course, the prop, problem developed. She says, you know what? We've got to have children. So she have to have children. She's got to get pregnant. She can't work the way she was working before. I had to go to work. My God. What a trauma. Very difficult. Well, so I said to my father, Dad, we've got to make some money. Because I can't earn a living like this. And now it's my turn. Because Clara, she did this for a number of years. It's enough, right? So I said, we've got to become owners. Because the brokers aren't making any money. The owners are making the money. So he said, Larry, when you have no money, how do you buy a building? I said, well, Two guys just went on board the Empire State Building. They went to a lot of other people. They went to, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000 people who each put in $5,000 to become a limited partner in the ownership of the Empire State Building. Why can't we do something like that? So my father said, can you figure it out? I said, hey, if they could do it, we could do it. I just have to figure it out. So he said, okay, try. I tried. First, we had to find a building that we could buy, schlepped along, went to 23rd Street, found a building. There's the building. We ended up trying to borrow $15,000 from a bank. When you have no collateral, it's very difficult to borrow anything. Fortunately, one banker finally agreed to lend us the $15,000, puts a paper in front of me, and it says, sign it. I said, what's that? He said, it's a promissory note. I looked at him. I said, you're really going to give us the money? He said, isn't that what you want? I said, yeah. I said, I just never thought you would do it. <laughs> so I signed it. Then he had my father sign it. And then he said, I want you to sign to me, to the bank, the contract that you're going to take as a result of using our $15,000. And that's the beginning of your process. Now, I didn't have a clue, and my father didn't have a clue. So then we proceeded to sit down and ask the banker, okay, now that we can sign the contract, what's our next step? <laughs> he looked at us, <laughs> wondering if he was doing the right thing, the smart thing, giving us the money. <laughs> he wasn't sure at that moment in time. I wasn't sure either. But nevertheless, we signed the contract. And he said, okay, now you've got to go out and get a mortgage, because this building has no mortgage. I said, okay, how do we do that? He says, go to an appraiser, get it appraised. So we go to a local appraiser, gives us the name of an appraiser, we call the appraiser, tell him, please appraise this thing. He said, how much do you want for a mortgage? I said, as much as we could get. Well, he looks at it and he says, you know, that building would probably justify $350,000. Now, we paid a price of 600 No, all cash, no, no debt. So we had to get a mortgage. So we went out. He says, go and get a mortgage. So we went to a local bank. Local bank gave us our first mortgage of $350,000. Okay, now what do we need? We no longer needed $600,000. We had the mortgage of three fifty. So all we needed now was two fifty. Two fifty in cash. A lot better than six hundred, right? Okay. Next thing I know, he gives me a telephone call in the office. He said, Larry, would you consider selling your contract? I said, what do you mean selling the contract? He says, would you consider, instead of buying this building, selling your contract to buy the building to a client of mine? And I said, why do I want to do that? He says, because you can make 100000 profit. I said, $100,000 profit? I was staggered. I said, you mean we just put down $15,000 to buy this building? And all we did is take a contract to it? 
and now you're offering us $100,000 profit for our contract? I couldn't believe this. I said, let me ask my father. Went inside and said, Dad, someone's just offered us $100,000 profit for our contract. He said, you're kidding. I said, no. He said, who? I said, I don't know. I'll find out. Went back to the, to the appraiser who had the client. I said, who is it? He tells me the name of the person. I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. Went back to my father, told him the name. I said, Dad, who is this guy? He said, Larry, this man is a very savvy buyer. You know what? If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. I said, but Dad, it's $100,000 profit. It's more money than God. He says, listen, you said we have to become owners and not brokers. Let's keep the building. Maybe it's a new beginning for us. So I looked at my father and said, okay, whatever you say, we'll do. So now we had to find $250,000, the balance of the price over the debt of three fifty, dollars and buy the building. So how do we do that? I had to go out to clients who my father got to know in the real estate, you know, as in brokerage, selling, renting loft space. And he went to a group of people, went to 20 people, and he had them each put down $10,000. And we raised 250000 between the group of them, and we took title to the building. And suddenly, we owned our first building. Now, do you think we knew what to do then? The answer is, we didn't have a clue. We didn't know. But through sink or swim, because we had to swim, we had to succeed, we figured out what to do, how to make the space look better, how to make it look brighter, how to get higher rents, how to improve the building. And the next thing we knew, instead of paying 1% a month, we paid one and a half percent a month. And everybody who invested in this building was thrilled. And they said, go out and find another building. So what did we do? With time, we found another building. And the second one, instead of being 600,000, the second one was a million five. The third one was four million. The fourth one was six million. After a while, instead of going to people for ten thousand dollars each, we went to them for twenty-five thousand each, and then fifty thousand each, and then a hundred thousand dollars each, because the buildings got bigger and the deals got bigger. And you know, a time came when the banks that wouldn't lend us fifteen thousand dollars called us and said, "You don't have to go out to people anymore." Tell us what you need, and we'll give you whatever you need. So it got to a point where we went to the banks, and we tell them, we needed $10 million, $20 million. This is to show you I was looking like a mensch at that point. <laughs> but it finally got to the point where suddenly, I had an opportunity, having acquired a number of buildings, 20, 25, 30 buildings, lots of buildings, and they got pretty big. I finally had an opportunity to bid for a piece of land owned by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey in Lower Manhattan. It was called the Keystone Site at the World Trade Center. And this was in 1980. I figured out what maybe could enable me to win the bid. And as luck would have it, we bid 25 cents a square foot higher than anybody else did. And we just won it by a squeak by a very small margin. 
So now had the opportunity to develop this piece of land. I figured, what could we do with this piece of land? As it turns out, we could build a two million square foot building on it. Two million square foot, that's 200,000 square meters. That was a big building for me and everybody else because I never built a building of this size before. So I went to the local bank. JP, that time it was called Chase Manhattan Bank. Today it's called J.B. Morgan Chase. And I said, what do you need? I said, I need $300 million to build this building. And guess what? They loaned me $300 million with which to build the building. So I remember the earlier days with my father, starting small. By this time, our lives had changed. My father lost him. He would have had a great time he could have hung around to see what happened. But here we are with this magnificent building at Seven World Trade Center. And I said, okay, we start a construction without any tenants. Normally, it's a good idea to have a tenant when you're building a building. But when you're building one with two million square feet of space, Every floor, every single floor in that building, and there were 47 of them, had a, the size of a football, a football field on it. Every floor. And so, we ran an ad with prospective tenant who came to look at the space. And the first tenant who came along was a group by the name of Solomon Brothers. They were a large space user. They looked at the building while it was under construction, just a couple of floors up, just beginning to rise. And they looked at it and said to me, you know what, we like this space, we like this building. We're going to take a million square feet. I said, a million out of the two million? They said, a million out of the two million. I said, that's pretty good. So we started drawing documents. And I let the world know that Solomon Brothers had made the decision to lease a million out of the two million feet. It's a huge transaction. It was the biggest in New York, biggest in the city. And I felt pretty good. Now the building was starting to rise. And suddenly, something terrible happens. Solomon Brothers became excited when they saw another building going up in another part of the city and fell in love with it. And they called me one day as the building is going up, 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 up. Now it's about... 25 stories up, on its way up to 47. And they said, Larry, we hate to tell you this, but we're not gonna make the deal with you any longer. We're gonna move to another building uptown. I said, but that, it'll cost you so much more money uptown. Whereupon the chief executive offer said to me, John Goodfriend, I remember him, remember his name. He said, Larry, we're making so much money what difference does it make? And I looked at him and I said to myself, this guy's in trouble and he doesn't know it. Because any time you can look at life and say, so what, cost more money? What difference does it make? We, go, we are making so much money. Not the way to think. And so I realized there was nothing I'm gonna be able to do to convince him. So I him, came home that night and I said, sweetheart, I said, we lost Solomon Brothers. And I said, I'm devastated. My sweetheart looks at me and she says, listen, somehow 
I don't know how. You're going to come out with a better deal. You're going to, you're going to do better. I step at a billion feet. How much better can you do? She said, I don't know, but my faith is in you. You'll, you'll prevail. I said, God, I hope you're right. Go back to work. Start talking to other prospective users. And all of a sudden, a company by the name of Drexel Burnham comes along. Who are they? They're big operators in the junk bond business. They're a big company, making a pot of money on Wall Street. Solomon was big, but Drexel, they might have even been bigger. So they come to the building. By this time, the building is 30 stories up, rising to 47. And they say, you know, we like the floors. We like the space. I said, so? They said, we think we'll take the building. I said, how much? They said, we'll take the building. I said, the building? It's got two million feet. He says, yeah, we're going to take two million feet. I said, two million feet? You're going to take the whole building? He said, yeah, that's a, why are you so surprised? I said, I just, I just, I'm surprised. <laughs> Came home that night, and I said, Booby, guess what? We came out better. We got a two million foot tenant for the whole building. She said, you see, I knew you'd come out better. I said, well, listen, keep the faith because we're sure going to need it. <laughs> so what happens then? Well, life is unpredictable. You never know. Suddenly, we picked up the Wall Street Journal and we see that a man by the name of Ivan Bosky, who's a Wall Street trader, decided to turn state's evidence against Michael Milken and implicate him in an insider trading scheme and a fraud. Mike Milken was the dean of the junk bonds. He was the most successful Wall Street trader in junk bonds. And when I saw that Ivan Bosky turned state's evidence against Michael Milken, and then I realized Michael Milken is the power behind Drexel Burnham the company that's taking the whole building. I said to myself, oy vez mia, we got a problem. I called Clara, I said, Bubby, we got a problem. And I told her what the problem was. She said, don't worry, you'll be fine. I said, I don't know how I'm gonna recover from this one. If this guy goes down, we'll never make this deal. And guess what? Michael Milken was indicted by the federal government and he ended up in jail. And because Wall Street is dependent upon integrity and good faith, and the ability to rely upon the honesty of others. It didn't take long before the entire firm of Drexel Burnham went down bankrupt. And I suddenly found myself, at this point, the building was finished, two million feet, and it was 100% vacant. And the Chase Manhattan Bank, who loaned me the $300 million, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I better come up with something 
fast. Because now I own the bank $300 million, and she didn't have $300 million, and I didn't have $300 million. I didn't know anybody who had $300 million. We were in a pickle. Guess what? Life takes strange turns because suddenly I got a call from Solomon Brothers. Do you remember the first people who only wanted to take a million feet? They called me and they said, you'll never guess what happened. I said, listen, I'll, I'll guess anything now. So, they said, guess what? I said, I can't guess anymore. Tell me. They said, the deal that we had uptown didn't work out. Can we still make a deal with you? I said to myself, can he still make a deal with me? <laughs> Truth of the matter is, in 12 hours, we had a handshake together, and he ended up taking not a million feet, but a million three hundred thousand square feet. Something's happening here. Signed the lease for a million three hundred thousand square feet. Okay. And as a result, with that kind of quality tenant occupying a million three hundred thousand square feet in the building. It was fast. We released up the balance of the building, quickly. And here we sat, and I looked at my booby, and I said, sweetheart, do you realize we accomplished the full lease up of this building, two million feet at Seven World Trade Center? I said, I never dreamt that I could do anything of this magnitude. I said, we got very, very lucky. She said, well, okay. You know, now maybe you ought to think about just being less grandiose. Maybe be a little more conservative because you've done something that's really terrific here. And it was very, very good for the family, very good for, for us. And we were very, very fortunate. So, around this time, We were in the 90s, and I found myself spending time with a gentleman by the name of Yitzhak Shamir, president of the State of Israel. We were going back and forth to provide, try to provide the housing. I told you about the experience that we had with the car alarm and the, and the Scud missiles. and. Clara was leading missions, I was leading missions, and it was a very exciting time in our lives. And the governor of New York, George Pataki, decided one day that maybe it would be good to privatize the ownership of the World Trade Center. So I got a call from the governor's office. And they said, would you ever consider owning the World Trade Center? And I said, would I? I said, I was topping off the steel for the original, for the building. I remember looking up at how big my building was, two million feet, and it was a peanut by comparison to the Twin Towers. They were really big. They were 110 stories high. And they contained 10 million square feet of space. I said to myself, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could own the Twin Towers? So I said to the governor, I said, you know, I got to check with my, 
my bride. But I have a feeling she's going to say it's okay. <laughs> so, came home and I said, sweetheart, guess what? And I told her. The governor asked if we'd be interested in buying the Twin Towers. And she said, are you crazy? I said, no. She says, how much are they going to sell it for? I don't know. A lot of money. She said, well, how are you going to be able to do that? I said, I don't have a clue yet. I said, but first, we've got to make the decision. Should we try to buy the Twin Towers? She said, well, if you think it's a good idea, it's up to you. If you think it's good, then go for it. But you have to make the decision. The way we led our lives, and still do. She's very good when it comes to kids. And early on, I realized, let her make the decisions when it comes to the kids. Discuss it together, come to a conclusion together, so we're one mind, right? Both of us the same mind. And then one of us execute when it comes to the kids, Clara. When it came to business, I got to know what I was doing. It was a lot of luck, but also got to know what I was doing. We talk, talk about it together, discuss it, and then make a bloody decision. I said, okay. So she said, listen, if this is what you want to do, go ahead. So I said, I think I'd like to try to buy the Trade Center. So it was now, I think, toward the end of the century. And the year 2000 was coming to a close. And now I got involved in it. And we started a very intensive focus. And guess what? We qualified to be one of the 27 purchases, potential purchases, who were deemed credible enough to be able to make a bid and be able to close on the Trade Center. Once that happened, I said to all my people, forget about anything else we've got on the table. Put it all aside. If we can own the World Trade Center, that's what I want to go for. So put everything else aside, forget about it, and just focus on the Trade Center. And so with time, we went from being one of the 27 bidders down to one of 10 bidders. And then we became one of five bidders. And then one of three bidders. And I said, oh my God, is it possible we can own the World Trade Center? Could this happen? The three final bids. One bid, 3.15 billion dollars. The second bid, 3.150 bid. And the third, 3.2 billion. There was a separation of $50 million between each of us. Now, $50 million is a lot of money. Except that when it's the difference between 3.15 bit, 3.2, and 3.25, it's only $50 million. It's a rounding error when you're talking about that magnitude of money. It's change. Sounds crazy because it's so huge, but $50 million in this picture it's nothing.
I was thinking about the sale, thinking about the purchase, because this was very close to happening. And my wife went out to California to visit with her older daughter. And I said, as soon as this is over, I'm coming out. I left a restaurant, I was walking home that night, thinking about the Trade Center. It was getting so close, and I wanted, wanted desperately to own it. And I felt we were almost there. And I get to Madison Avenue at 57th Street, just almost at my house, walking home on this very cold night. I see a green light. I cross into the street. And the next thing I know, out of nowhere, a car comes along and slams into me. Next thing I found, I was almost dead because I was lying there in the middle of 57th Street. My pelvis crushed in 12 places. A drunk driver had gone right through the green light for me, red for him. And I thought everything was over. Ended up in the hospital. The pain was horrible. I said to the doctors, give me more morphine, because the morphine is the only thing that kills the pain. And three days later, I woke up at the hospital. I said, what day is it? They say, it's the 28th day of January. I said, the best and final bids are due on the 30th. I got only three days left. I said, get everybody, I said, kill the morphine. Get everybody together here in the hospital. Call the guys from my office. Get them in here. I said, I need some pizza. I need some, I need some rooms. And we had to sit down in that hospital with everybody there. The pain, I said, forget about the pain. There was too much at stake. And we submitted the best and final bid on the 31st day of the month. Net result, we ended up winning the bid to own the World Trade Center. And so here, you see a lot of happy faces because this picture was taken on the 26th day of July of 2001. The 26th day of July of 2001. And it says, there's my son, my daughter, younger daughter, my bubby, gentleman on the corner, the gentleman on the end, the lawyer who helped me close the deal. And we had it. Of course, what had happened in the intervening months between the day my pelvis was crushed, I found myself in the hospital, had to learn to walk again. It was the most horrendous time of my life. And I finally succeeded in putting the man who did this to me Turns out he did it to other people too. I ended up putting him in jail. It was not sufficient joy or pleasure. It wasn't worth it. But at least he's off the streets and he can't do it again. But what I went through in terms of having to learn to walk again was an absolute horror. So here we were feeling happy. We won the Trade Center. And I remember looking at Clara and I said, sweetheart, we have the brass ring. We can do anything you want with our lives. Tell me what you like to do. Because one of the things I've always deprived you of is the kind of time that I could give you once we had the brass ring. I said, we now have it. Whatever you want to do, we can do. 
tell me what you want to do, and we'll do it. That was on the 26th day of July, 2001. On the morning of 9-11, I'm getting ready, getting dressed to go to the dermatologist. I have light colored hair, light skin. The sun is a disaster for me. I can't take the sun. So every three months, I went to the dermatologist like clockwork. I had to. And that morning, I said to Clara, I said, sweetheart, I've got so much work to do down at the Trade Center. Cancel the dermatologist. I'm going down. And she said, you can't cancel again. You canceled last time. You cannot cancel again. And she got angry. Now, when you're married to somebody for 50 years, and they get upset, and they get angry, and they start screaming. The world comes to an end. And I said, okay, 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 I'm sorry. The words are yes, dear. Whatever you want, I'll do. Don't get angry. Please don't get angry. She said, okay, but you're going to the dermatologist, you're going this morning, and you're not going downtown. Hmm. Wow. Suddenly, the phone rings. It's, it's the captain of our boat, docked at Chelsea Piers, not far from where we live and not far from the Trade Center. And he said, Mrs. Silverstein, is everything okay with Mr. Silverstein? She said, of course. Why? He said, turn on your television set. And that's when we saw the North Tower in flames, and we saw the plane circling around before it slammed into the South Tower and caused it to end up in flames. And therein was the day of the disaster of 9-11. Changed our lives, changed the lives of everybody in our world, changed the lives of everybody in the world, certainly civilized people, no matter where they live around the globe. And so we lost almost 3,000 people. It was a miracle. My life wasn't lost because she kept me from going down to the trade center. She said, you've got to go to the dermatologist. By the way, I never made it to the dermatologist that day but at least my intentions were right. And Silverstein Properties lost four of its employees. And those four employees had six children among them. And that was a horror. It was just terrible. Now, what I quickly had to do was find out what my obligations were. Of course, I had signed a contract and now owned the Trade Center. And I had a lease, lease obligations to pay $120 million a year in ground rent. And I only signed that contract for 99 years. And there I was, 70 years of age. I was a little optimistic, but there I was with an obligation, 99-year obligation to pay the port $120 million a year, forever, seemed like. I had to, repl I had to rebuild like kind, like quality, and I had an obligation to collect the insurance proceeds from the policies, because that's the only place the money could come from, from the insurance proceeds. 
That was my job, my obligation. Of course, they owned the policies. And you could see what happened. You could see the devastation. You could see the obliteration. Everything came down. Plus, Seven World Trade Center. It wasn't part of the Trade Center, but it was right north of it. And when the antenna came down from the top of the North Tower, it went right through the facade of Seven World Trade Center. It started a fire, and by the end of the afternoon, the building just collapsed. Fortunately, no lives were lost in Seven, because there was enough time between when the fire started in that building and the time it collapsed to make sure nobody was left in the building. And so, first thing I said to myself was, started looking around. Everybody was moving out of Lower Manhattan. Everybody wanted to get out of there. It was as if somebody said, with well, the last one out, please turn off the lights. It was terrible. So I looked and I thought, and I said to myself, I'm gonna have to do something here, quickly, because people were leaving, going uptown. And I said to myself, and then I said to Clara, and I said to everybody else, we can't leave this building this way. We can't leave it with this big open expanse. We've got to rebuild this building. We've got to rebuild Seven World Trade Center. And we've got to do it fast. Because you've got to show the world that this part of the world is going to come back. And that we're going to rebuild it. And that the firms that were here, the companies that were here, will come back and the thousands of people leaving their apartments, they will come back. But we've got to show them a sign that this is not going to stay like this forever. We're going to rebuild. And we're going to find, get the money from the insurance companies with which to build. And so the floor plan, as it evolved, is what you see here. It's not the same size, it's not the same shape of the original seven, but we had to make changes, and we had to do it fast. And so what you're seeing is the floor plan of a building, not of two million feet, or we could get into the same space because of the need to reimpose the street grid, was a million seven hundred thousand square feet. So the floor sizes were no longer a football field, they were now only 42,000 feet. And the building is going to contain not two million feet, but a million seven. And that's one of the sacrifices we have to make. I said, let's make it and let's get on with it. And so, next thing you know, we've got the designs of a building. And the first design meeting was in April of 2000. And construction began shortly thereafter in 2002. And we went to finance the building with Liberty Bonds, construction bonds from the Liberty Bond program that was initiated by the federal government to enable us to rebuild the Trade Center. But it still required insurance company bonds, insurance company payments under the policies. And so, next thing you know, this building was under full construction. It took 9,000 people to build it. It cost not the $300,000, not the $300 million it caused the first time. This time, cost close to a billion dollars. Costs had gone way up, and everything was far more difficult. 
in addition to which I decided this had to be a first class building. This had to be the best building, the safest building that was ever built in America because we're going to occupy a full floor in this building. And I only want to put my family and I only want to put my people and I only want to put my tenants into a building that is now indestructible, a building that was built unlike any other building built in America, a building that could never again be affected by what happened on 9-11. And so we went through an enormous amount of effort to find, to find out what happened on 9-11 to cause the Twin Towers to collapse and at the same time decide how to build a building safer and stronger and impenetrable so that we'd feel safe in it and everybody else would feel safe in it also. We scoured the world for the best engineers. Where do you think we ended up? There's a country that apparently has lots of problems in making its buildings explosion proof. It's called Israel. And guess what? It's got some of the best engineers in the world who understand safety in big buildings. Why? Because they have problems with that for the last 40, 50 years. They keep having explosions in their country. And who do we find? There's a guy by the name of Ruben Eitan who spent his life making Israeli buildings, the safest buildings they could possibly be. We said, Reuben, we got to schlep you to New York. We need you. So we took Reuben, schlepped him to New York. Whole group of us, we assembled the best engineers in the world. One of them was your Reuben Eitan from the state of Israel. God bless him. He worked with us. He helped us build, he helped us design the safest building ever built in the United States of America, bar none. And that is the new Sem World Trade Center. And that's what you're looking at here. It is a fantastic building. And all of the, what we learned about how not to build a high-rise office building in New York, again, we now have all of those same features as part of the design for every building down at the Trade Center. And because of it, the building code of the city of New York vastly improved, much better than it ever was. So to give you a sense of the size of the building you're looking at, the new Seven World Trade Center, you know the three buildings built by Israeli? They're about, if you take the three of them, put them all together, add 10% to that total, you're going to come to the 1.7 million square feet of space, 170,000 square meters of office space. That's what, that's what seven contains today. And it's the best building that was ever built. And it won every conceivable award that you can possibly ask for, for first class buildings. And so we, we put art, interesting art, all over the building, in it and in front of it. And one of the pieces here, you see in the, in the background, Jenny Holzer is the leading exponent of computerized world, word programs. And this one that you see on the left side of the screen is a program that's 60 feet in length. And uh, she's really a neat lady. It's also a completely gold, it's a, it's a, it's a LEED certified gold building. Rainwater collects on the roof that irrigates the park in front of the building. It's used recycling materials, the latest in glass technology. It's energy conservant. You name it, it's won 
an award for it. Whoops, what did I do here? I am at. And these are some of the some of the leading issues that has made an enormous difference in the building, in the structure, because the core is 12,000 pound hardened concrete. It's four feet thick and it surrounds the life safety features of the building. It's really an extraordinary example of how to build buildings. And when you look at the glass and the materials, and you look at the art that surrounds the building, that's in it and surrounds it, that's a piece by Jeff Koons. Believe it or not, it just shows you how life can be. You see that piece, that red balloon that's in the photograph? That was, it's a piece built by Jeff Koons, the artist. Anybody heard the name Jeff Koons? Does that sound familiar, right? Anybody know the name? Okay, well, he did three of these pieces. So, I'm sorry, he did five of these pieces. One of them is with us. One of them just sold in an auction in London, $23.1 million. I would have been smarter to buy the art and to do the buildings, but I wasn't smart enough. But nevertheless, that's what happens with values. But you see the list of tenants. Seven was an empty building. When I finished it, there wasn't a tenant in it. I was the first tenant, one floor. But then I signed a lease with Moody's. They took 750,000 feet of space, one tenant. I signed the lease, and then once they signed the lease, everybody signed up and was a, became a very successful building. And when people saw how this building suddenly got completed and how it got fully occupied, they began to say to themselves, you know what, if this is what's happening here, then maybe he can accomplish the same thing throughout the rebuilding of the World Trade Center. Right? So here you see the space. It's column free space. This takes an engineer's understanding because normally you need columns to hold up the buildings. You see, you look at the photograph, no columns. Where the hell are they? What's holding up the buildings? Well, interesting. But when you talk to the engineers, and some of you understand this, a lot of you, I suspect, understand this, it's wonderful to design these buildings so as to provide for flexibility and column-free space and floor-to-ceiling glass so that you can see out as far as you want to see. And so, during this period of time, Building 7, and you could see the port was trying to finish the site, to clear the site. And shortly thereafter, by 2003, 7 was rising. But at that point in time, the governor of New York decided to have a competition to develop the master plan for the site. The man who won it, Dan Liebeskin. And the plan that he proposed was a group of buildings around a memorial park, an eight acre memorial park. And what you're seeing is exactly what you see in this photo. And so ultimately, it became a master plan delineating everything that was going to be on the site. The buildings, the five office buildings, the eight acre park, Memorial Park, the 9-11 Memorial Plan, and ultimately the completed site. And by 2006, I'd gone out and chosen the architects who were going to design these buildings. And so you see on the left side, a fellow by the name of Fumihiko Maki, Japanese architect, Pritzker Prize winner, magnificent buildings to his credit around the globe. The same thing with 
the man to my right, Norman Foster. Also, Pritzker Prize winner, magnificent buildings to his credit around the globe. And on the right, Richard Rogers. So these are, these are unbelievably wonderful architects. And so, by 2006, seven was a completed building, and there were the other buildings, looking magnificent, beautiful. But we ran into a problem. We couldn't collect the insurance, because the insurance companies didn't want to pay. There were 22 insurance companies defending 22 insurers who didn't want to pay their obligations under the policies. And so they took me to court. And I had to beat them in court, the lower court, and then had to take an appeal and win in the upper court. So they owed me four and a half billion dollars with which to build these buildings. It wasn't enough, but at least it was four and a half billion dollars. It could start the process. And I couldn't collect. So what do you do when you beat the insurance companies in court and they still won't pay? A new governor was just elected, Elliot Spitzer, an old friend who I knew well. I said, Elliot, if you don't help me, I'll never collect from the insurance companies. And guess what? He listened and he said, you know what? You're entitled. I'm going to get you the money. And in six months, he got me the four and a half billion dollars. The insurance companies didn't like me, but at least I got the money. And with the money, we could really start getting into. Seven was done, but now we could start with Tower 4, Tower 3, Tower 2, and Tower 1. And so, time. Okay, so, oh my God, look at the time. So, what we finally found ourselves with was in a, what's that? It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay? I'm starved, is everybody hungry? Don't stop. Well, what I want you to know, for some reason, the port lost its way, and it became an absolute mess. The organization found itself with all kinds of internal problems, had difficulty in executing their part of the, the agreement with us. And you could see the newspapers made them look terrible. And so it also caused tremendous delay and the mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, finally looked at this picture and he said, you know, he said, Silverstein, you're entitled to possession of the ground, of the, of the building parcels, because you're paying ground rent to the port and they have an obligation to give you those parcels. And, and if they don't, then they really have to be criticized. And so there was a major confrontation between the port and ourselves. And all of a sudden, thousands and thousands of workers who want to build these buildings, each building you know, takes 10,000 employees to build them. So the employees, they, they started spontaneously demonstrating in front of state offices and government offices. And the next thing you know, we ended up making a deal with the Port Authority. And there's a plan that gets set. And finally, everybody got together. And in 2010, we signed yet another set of agreements with the Port Authority. And so what you see is the beginning now of construction. And by 2013, we finished Tower 4, that's Fumihiko's, Fumihiko, Fumihiko Maki's building, and it's a beautiful building. He's a minimalist architect 
who designs beautiful buildings. And this one is gorgeous. And its lobby is 47 feet in height. It's statuesque and it's elegant. And a one wins every single architectural award you could think of. And then some tenants come along to take large amounts of space. And when you look, wait a minute, something's happening here. And when you look at where we are today, four World Trade Center is open, one World Trade Center is open, three is under construction. There you have a, a shot of the magnificence of one World Trade Center, which used to be called the Freedom Tower. Now they like to call it one World Trade Center. Condé Nast has just moved into a million two hundred and fifty thousand square feet in Tower One. The building looks beautiful. The ceiling height here is almost sixty feet and elegant. And when you look out the windows, what you said, the lobby, lobby is an elegant lobby. Look out the windows, all you see, floor to ceiling glass, it is as magnificent as anything you will ever see in an office building today. And when you look at the view of Tower One, which you see all over the metropolitan area, it is a heartwarming sight. And when you look at Tower Three, that is now under construction, and what that lobby will look like when it is nearing completion in another few years. The elegance of the lobby, the magnificence of the interior elevators and escalators and tra mass vertical transportation. And what's going to happen as this building continues to rise. And there it is next to the Calatrava Design Path Terminal. Magnificent building. And there's Tower 3. I have to tell you something interesting. Last week, two weeks ago, we closed $1.6 billion of construction loan financing for this building, Tower 3. 30-year term, construction and permanent financing. Everything, whole ball of wax. Interest rate for 30 years, 5.3% all-inclusive. It's incredible. I never dreamt to be able to get one point, to borrow 1.6 billion for a term of 30 years at an interest rate of 5.6%. Nothing, nothing like that ever before. So it's going to be interesting because once we get finished with Tower 3, we're then going to proceed to Tower 2. And Tower 2, <laughs> Tower 2 is probably going to take about $2.4 billion. So that's going to be the, the next step. And you can see the wonderful, we have at least now 5 million square feet in the different buildings at the Trade Center. You can see the quality of the tenants, first class tenants, magnificent people from called the Tammy Group. It's people who are into technology, advertising, media, information services. And of course, when you look at Norman Foster's design of the top of Tower 2. It's a beautiful sight, and it's, it's a typical Norman Foster design. And you look at the exterior facade, the glass. You look at the ceiling heights. I mean, the grandeur, the elegance of these ceilings. The soaring heights. I mean, this is 67 feet in height. It's magnificent. And when you look at Greenwich Street, and you see the, the wings again of the Calatrava design, and the memorial, the memorial itself, the memorial park, the memorial to 3,000 people who lost their lives. 15 million visitors have visited this memorial park in just three years. And it's, it is beautifully done. And you can't help 
be impressed by how the names of the people who lost their lives are impressed around the reflecting pools of each one of what were the original footprints. And of course, the museum itself, the Memorial Museum, opened into earlier this year. A million people have already visited it. And then when you get to the crowning glory, the PATH terminal, that's going to be open next year, 2015. This is designed by Santiago Calatrava. It's glass, it's concrete, it's steel, it's aluminum, and it's white. Everything that Calatrava ever does is white, right? That's the way, that's the way he does, it designs everything. But it's magnificent. And you look at the interiors, the, the two levels of, of retail space, and you look at the glass and the steel and the aluminum and the white marble. And again, it's white. And then you look at the trans, the, cre the connections, below grade connections, again, designed by Calatrava. And how is it designed? Glass, steel, concrete, and white. And today, when you look at the, when you look at the building itself, it's an incredible building. You look at those wings that spread out 150 feet in each direction to the north and to the south. The building looks like it's going to take off. If it started flapping the wings, it could. And of course, the Fulton Transit Hub, which is also complete, just finished, just done. Another billion to beautiful piece of architecture done by Snow Hedder. And of course, this is all part of the most incredible transportation access any place in the city. And so downtown today is a completely new and different neighborhood, completely rebuilt with the magnificent restaurants and shops. Population has tripled its size. You've got 60,000 families down there. You have first class schools, first class restaurants. You have hotels, you've got 14 hotels under construction. I mean, hotels, Jesus. You know, some crazy guy came along. His wife told him he was too heavily, in, too heavily invested in the trade center. That was my booby talking to me one day. She said, you know, you have too much money invested in one place in the World Trade Center. She said, you ought to diversify. Okay, so I diversified. What did I do? It was a piece of land that Moody's had vacated. She said, diversify. Okay, I moved the block to the north. I bought the Moody's site. And what you're seeing is the Four Seasons Hotel going up. I figured I needed something to do in my spare time. So we're now building an 82-story Four Seasons Hotel with the Four Seasons condos. And guess what? It's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous building. Wouldn't surprise me if we ended up living there one day. Who knows? But the lobby is magnificent, strictly four seasons. The interiors are quite beautiful. The space is wonderful. And you look at the soaring quality of this building and you say to yourself, wow, because there to the left, you see that high rise building that looks white. That's not quite white, but it looks like limestone. And by golly, it's the new Four Seasons Hotel. It's about 90, 920 feet in height. Again, another transaction. It's a billion dollars in cost, but it's quite spectacular. And so what you're looking at here when it's all done is about a total expenditure of $30 billion. The PATH terminal itself with the soaring wings, about five billion for that one alone. It's the most incredible PATH terminal, terminal, end of a design any place. But this fellow Santiago Calatrava is an exquisite architect, does beautiful designs, but are his buildings expensive? Thank God it's being paid for by the port and not by me. <laughs> so when we're Next downtown together, 
and I suggest anytime you want to come, come and we'll show you what's going on because it's pretty exciting. The other thing I'll tell you is that we should be finished down there by 2018. So this is nearing the end of 2014, we're almost in 2015. Another couple of years, another three years, give us a little more time and then come and visit us because what we'll show you is the most magnificent rebuilding of the World Trade Center anybody ever imagined could be accomplished. So I just want to say, come and visit, and I certainly thank you for listening, and I just want to tell you, I think you guys are terrific living in this wonderful country.